real. This is the podcast where we talk about things that make the scriptures become real for us and thus apply uh, or make it so we can apply them better to our own lives because we need the power that comes from the scriptures. So I'm your host, Kerry Mielstein, and this is a short cast, a summary of just a couple of things from Joshua. We've done some great things with Lamar and with George Pierce, uh, but it's occurred to me that there's one thing that I've kind of talked about a few times in past podcasts that I didn't tie up as neatly as I would have liked in these little things we've been saying about um, about what happened with Joshua and the conquest of Canaan. And so this will be very short, but I want to highlight a couple of things to tie some things together. If you'll remember, right, and if uh, you may not have listened to this podcast, if not, I would encourage you to go back to listen to the podcast I did on numbers and atonement and faith in Christ and so on. And we talked about when the spies went into Israel. Uh, They went into the the promised land. It was Canaan at the time. So the spies went into Canaan and they came back with the report that the walls were really big and the guys were really big. And as a result, 10 of the the spies representing 10 of the tribes said, uh, no way can we do this. Interestingly, it was uh, not Judah or Ephraim. They had the faithful reports. Uh, That's Caleb and Joshua, but from the tribes of Judah and Ephraim. Uh, the two leadership tribes, but people didn't follow their lead, which was a mistake to not follow that righteous leadership. In any case, uh, they said, these guys are too big and the walls are too big. Let's not do it. Caleb and Joshua said they are that big, but God can help us go in. Uh, they didn't listen. And so now we've we've talked about this a couple of times. We now have this generation that's going in that is faithful and does believe in God's delivering power. So it seems like it's worth talking about how did God overcome those uh, issues for them? They were real challenges, just like we have real challenges in our life, but was God able to overcome them? And I think it's worth just highlighting how we overcame them. And and so let's just, we'll zoom through this, but let's look at it. Of course, we all know the story, and and we kind of went into this more in depth with George, but the story of Jericho. They had a big wall. That wall did not prove to be a problem. God brought that wall down, or at least enough of it to get them into the city, as we talked about with George. Uh, and, and I think that's so worth remembering that this insurmountable obstacle was not insurmountable with God's side. And it's also worth uh, highlighting, and I think we touched on this with George, but that the way God asked him to overcome it made no sense to anyone. The idea that walking around silently and then walking around and blowing trumpets would bring a wall down is a ridiculous idea. It, it just on the face of it, that's not going to work. And the walking wouldn't work. It has to be God. Uh, And we should remember that, that sometimes there are insurmountable things in our lives, things that are too much for us, and that the way that God seems to be whispering to us to conquer it won't make any sense. That's irrelevant. You just do what God asks you to do, and it will work out. Uh, He can bring those walls down, whether it's by walking around them or any other method. Just trust that God can bring the walls down. Um, and then, of course, there were some really big guys. We'll get to the story of Goliath later, although he was a Philistine and the Philistines weren't in the land at this time yet. But still, you can see that God can bring down big guys. But let's look at some other ways that he brings down these big guys. Because the next thing, the next story that happens shows both how God can help uh, the Israelites with the big walls and with the big guys. So they do go after uh, Jericho. They go against Ai, but Achan had kept some things he wasn't supposed to, and so God wasn't with them, and so they had to get rid of that, and then uh, God helped them conquer Ai. But then the next thing that happens is actually one of my favorite stories in the Bible. Um, what happens is the the Gibeonites. So there is a city. Uh, you, you've got this deep valley, and by the way, I'll just say that um, if you go to my YouTube channel, and I mentioned this with the, the video with Lamar, but or the, the uh, podcast episode with Lamar, uh, but if you go to my YouTube channel, channel, the scriptures are real, and there are two playlists, and you go to the one that is Old Testament classes, uh, there you'll see I have several on Joshua and the Conquest, where I'll show you maps and pictures of all of these things in, in more detail than what we're doing here. We're just doing it quickly here. So, But for those of you who'd like to go into it in more detail and see pictures and maps, that's the place to do it. In any case, um, you've got uh, Gibeon is up at the, the top, like about the same uh, kind of elevation and, and east-west uh, longitude as uh, Jerusalem. So uh, Jericho and the place where the Israelites is camp, camp, are camping are down in the Dead Sea Valley, or the Jordan Rift Valley. This is the lowest uh, valley on earth. 
And then uh, Gibeon is this hill that's uh, about 2,600 feet, uh, probably about 2,400 feet above sea level, whereas you're looking at about uh, Jericho is about six, 700 feet below sea level. So there, there's quite a, a difference there. In any case, the Gibeonites, like so many people, have figured out mm, you can't beat Israel. And so they come up with a plan to trick Israel. And they put on their really old clothes and they get their old moldy cheese and uh, get their donkeys all covered in, in dirt and dust. And they come down and they meet the Israelites and they say, we are on a journey from far away. Uh, we're just coming into this land like you are. Maybe we can be allies. Now, remember, God has told the Israelites they should not ally themselves with anyone in the land. Um, but these people seem like they're not from the land. So Joshua says, great, let's be allies. And then God says to them, you know, Joshua, you should have asked me because they actually are people in the land that I told you not to make alliances with. So now Joshua is kind of stuck. He's promised these guys he'd be their ally. Uh, instead, he makes them servants of the tabernacle. They're going to uh, hew wood and, and bring water for the tabernacle, but they are allies. So now all of the other Canaanites have heard that the Gibeonites are allies with the Israelites. And they say, well, we can't beat the Israelites, but we can beat the Gibeonites. So their plan is that they, they gather a whole bunch of them from these big cities from Lachish and Jericho, I mean, uh, Jerusalem and other cities around there. And they go to march against um, Gibeah and um, or Gibeon, sorry, against Gibeon. And uh, the Gibeonites see this and they get a messenger down to Jericho. So he has to go way down these, these hills to, to Jericho uh, and will actually Gilgal, which is where Joshua is just north of Jericho. And uh, Joshua, um, by the way, Gilgal just means like to circle up. So this is where they've circled their wagons, as it were, and the, they've made their uh, camp there. And um, Joshua hears about this and he does an all night march to come to the aid of his allies. So that in the morning, as all of these Canaanites are about to attack Gibeon and the city of Gibeon, suddenly then they're on the, the west side of Gibeon. Suddenly on the east side, coming up over that hill is all the host of Israel. And uh, this is bad news for the Canaanites because they've just been caught outside their walls. They did not want to fight the Israelites outside their walls. They wanted to sit behind their walls in their cities and make the Israelites try to come through their walls to attack them but they've just been caught outside their walls. And uh, as a result, uh, this big battle is uh, engaged in and huge hailstones come down and kill all sorts of Canaanites. That's um, part of how the big guys are taken care of. God just sends some, some huge stones out of heaven to kill them. That's uh, another thing God can do, right? It doesn't matter how big the obstacles are. God can find a way to take care of us. So these big guys are being killed there. Uh, and the battle is is going well for the Israelites and they're defeating all of these people, but they're running away. They're, they're retreating and running back to their cities and the Israelites are, are uh, chasing them, trying to catch them and kill them before they get to where their cities are. Um, the problem is it's about to get dark and they'll escape during the dark and get back behind the walls of their cities and the Israelites don't want them to get behind those walls. So what happens? Well, God has the sun and moon stand still. That way they can't hide so easily and the Israelites are able to keep chasing them and defeat them. So this whole army is defeated before they can get back behind their city walls. So this is the second way that the walls are taken care of, because while it's a legitimate concern, it's not when God is on your side. So that's how really all of the big armies of the southern part of Canaan are defeated. Now, all of the people in the, the big cities in the northern part of Canaan hear about this, and the biggest city with the biggest army is Hatsor. And Hatsor sends out to all the other people and says, come meet us here at Hatzor. Let's band together and we'll defeat the Israelites if we band together. So they all do go band together. And in this case, it's interesting. You see both with the story of Jericho and with the story of Gibeon, God finds these ways to get rid of the walls or, or, or have the walls not be a factor and he kills the big guys and so on. Um, we don't really have any story like that in Hatzor other than that they just all gathered in one place, which seems to have made it so that Israel didn't have to siege wall after wall after wall after wall. You lose people when you have to siege a city. Even if you have far superior numbers and power, you're going to lose a lot of people. And if you have to go through 20 cities, then you're going to lose more people than if you had to go to one. And they went just to Hatzor, which did have big walls and, and big gates and so on, but they got through and they defeated that army. 
We don't hear really uh, anything miraculous in it. I'm sure God did help them, uh, but they, uh, I'm sure there were miracles, but they defeated them. And suddenly all of the major cities of Canaan have been defeated and Israel didn't have to go against so many huge guys and against so many huge walls uh, because God made it so they didn't have to. And that's worth thinking about. As, as I talked about with George, that means they've conquered armies. They haven't occupied all these cities. They didn't even go to most of the cities because they kept finding these armies conveniently gathering for them somewhere else. So they didn't even have to go to most of the cities. So occupying is a different thing. And that will take some years to do. But I think it's worth stopping and thinking about how their legitimate concerns were not really an obstacle with God on their side. There are tremendous lessons for us to learn from that. Uh, and hopefully it bolsters our faith. And we can approach things the way Caleb and Joshua did when they said, if God is with us, who can be against us? And uh, yes, these guys are big, and yes, the obstacles are real, but it doesn't matter when God is on our side. I hope we can approach life that same way, knowing that whatever the problem is, God will see us through. And of that I testify in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.